I'll trade you for your candy Some gorgeous match lights My camera, it's a dandy Six by nine, just your size You want my porcelain figure A watch, a submarine A Rembrandt salami black lingerie from Veen I sell Very smooth. You buy my goods, and boy, my goods are keen. Black market cuckoo clocks and treasures. Black market a thousand little pleasures. My name is Karen Kohler. I'm a German-American singer, actor, and writer. For over two decades, I fueled a performance career from my base in New York City as a Kleinkunst or small stage specialist. I'm passionate about story songs and crossbreeding in various languages, a range of theatrical and musical styles from jazz and Delta blues to classical, folk rock, and cabaret. I live for the unconventional in art and in love, threads of which come through my prose, poetry, my lyrics, and the conversations I have with other adventurers on my podcast, The Rude Woke Sessions. I'm a 1985 graduate of the U of A, and this is my first time back in the desert in 15 years. This week, I'll be presenting a performance piece called Songs, Psychedelics, and Seizures, a one-woman flow. I've chosen a topic with which I'm deeply familiar. Through these three flow states, or flow gates as I like to call them, and aided by forces both animal and fungal, I've become the thing I was doing. If science has identified that psychedelics can quiet the default mode network, and avail a person of other potent forms of conscious participation, well, this has existed in art since forever. My profession is to stray outside the DMN. I'm hired and paid to flow and to insert my tiny little straw into the vastness of consciousness. Psychedelics are a quicker way to this flow state than the dedicated practice that performance art requires. And a seizure state is just another way into something vast and mysterious and moreover essential. How do I know? Because I've come back from each of these episodes with new language. Through these sacred lenses of music, medicine, and the mystery of epilepsy, I've been able to shine a light back to source and to mirror that light from source back to my default mode. I've discovered that flow is in many ways a more natural and ordinary state for me, and that this, the DMN, is the altered, non-ordinary state. It's a play space for consciousness. I flow now more than ever. Now and then flow comes and takes me, but mostly I consciously leave the shore and enter it. We all have our thing. We're called to it at a young age. What were you playing at once upon a time? When you weren't actually flowing as a kid, what was your practice for flow? So I'd like to tell you a story about a singing experience so peak and optimal that when I left the stage at the town hall in New York City, I said, if that were to have been my last song, I picked a great one. Let me also tell you about the nearness of death that has accompanied me since my first psychedelic trip ended. But first, let me tell you about a hawk. I can't give you anything but love. 
baby It's the only thing I've plenty of Baby Dream my wild, scheme my wild You're sure to find Happiness And I guess All the things you've always planned for Gee, I'd like to see you look and smell Baby Diamond watches will worth doesn't sell no more Baby Till that lucky day you know darn well Baby I can't give you anything but love <laughs> Do robots and humans know about art? Suggestions for capture designs. Hello, I'm Ana Rivas from the Faculty of Fine Arts at the Complutense University of Madrid in Spain. I will talk here about a special type of capture. Enjoy. So here's the index. I will talk about captures. What are they? I'll present a conceptual art proposal with six different options to design. What are captures? In a world where roughly 40% of the internet traffic is non-human, the automated question-answer tests known as captures come to service to distinguish between humans and bots. By the way, bots are disembodied robots. They are programmed, not machines. We can say that captures are administered by bots to test both humans and bots. Captures are a form of reverse Turing tests because we have to prove that we are not robots. Uh, the acronym stands for Completely Automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. In the web, capture authentication is intended to allow the access to humans and block it to bots. This typically happens before we get the fill in forms found on many websites. Why do we have to prove we are human? Because bots are supposed to be malicious performing automatic bulk use of the internet, creating false users and putting them, putting them to the service of spam, propaganda, sabotage, false product reviews, etc. A modality of visual capture offers a number of images, usually of streets to improve Google Maps or letters or digits to improve Google Books and they must be correct, correctly selected uh, following simple instructions. As bots continue to outwit these challenges, captures must become increasingly complex. This, in turn, plays against the experience of the human user who, to say the least, loses time and energy solving them. In the worst cases, for example, visual disability, the human user is unable to get through the challenge of the test and cannot therefore access the form in question. The present conceptual piece suggests the creation of captures not in the service of private interests, but in the disinterested service of art. The work proposes six capture design versions, along with questions and issues that these models may arouse. The concept of art in relation to humans and bots. The visual captures here suggested put into play a specific criterion for the selection of images, their artistry. 
following the usual capture scheme and designed with a Roboto font, the command is select all squares with art. One possible final aspect of, the cap of this capture is this image. The user clicks on the image or images that he or she deems appropriate as answer to the injunction. Henceforth, given this structure of the capture, there are a number of possible design options, each of which raises different questions and problems. Six options are here discussed in the context of Western culture and with a primarily morphological perspective. Please keep in mind that the previous couple of images are not the only possible visual content of the following capture models. They serve merely as a draft. Since the goal of this presentation is speculative and ludic, it does not yield specific concretizations of each of the following models. So here is model one. The capture images belong to two types famous artworks and non-aesthetically intended images of any kind. In principle, a human with sufficient general knowledge should be able to identify the well-known works of art and would therefore make the right choices to pass the test. But since the web is full of repertoires of such images, for a bot, it would also seem relatively easy to identify these artworks, even if they did not appear in their integrity, for example, cut to fit a square format. On the other hand, humans lacking artistic culture could go wrong, for example, mistaking a piece of hardware with a contemporary sculpture or vice versa, or mistaking installations with garbage. This couple of images deserve some explanation. At the top, the artists Sarah Goldschmidt and Eleonora Chiari made an installation called Where Shall We Go Dancing Tonight? at the Bolzano Museum in Italy in 2015. The cleaner, understandably, tidied the room thoroughly afterwards, as is apparent in the second image, thinking that there had been a very, <laughs> very uh, energetical premiere the night before. Model 2. Capture images include works of traditional genres such as painting and sculpture, but of two kinds, low artistic quality, amateur productions, and professional quality. Here, the criterion of taste is expected to operate. Humans trained in what is understood by art can make a selection that leaves out amateur works which nevertheless comply with the technical requirements to qualify as painting, sculpture, etc. However, kitsch has been claimed as an artistic genre which could lead their supporters to click on amateur works as a legitimate act of subversion against the dominant taste. On the other hand, generative art, which is synthetically GAN algorithm generated productions, which sell very well in the art world, and defy the notion of author originality. Which capture images would such a trained bot choose? Here is model three. All capture images are taken from those offered by Google as a response to the search for the word art. Here, digital sociology comes into play, the concept of art in web disseminated contents. In view of the results, it can be inferred that this criterion does neither obey to an educated taste nor to a specific artistic genre or technique. A bot capable of such simple tasks as exploring the search engine under the semantic criterion of the word art could easily select all the images named or tagged with such a word, attributing to them an artistic quality that some connoisseurs would put in question. Model 4 
The capture images belong to two types, good quality artworks with ugly subject matter such as trash and beautiful images taken from non-artistic visual repertoires, for example, science. The other questions at stake are the relation between art and beauty and the aesthetic enjoyment of ugliness. The subject matter would not be beautiful in the artwork, whereas there would indeed be perceived beauty according to traditional artistic criteria in the images of other repertoires. The bots that may have been programmed or may have learned to recognize such plastic values would have a greater difficulty than humans would when facing the challenge of recognizing art images as such. If guided by formal cues, they may well opt for the non-artistic but visually interesting images. Model 5. The capture images are totally random, with no specific criterion or intentionality. Here, uh, please, uh, I want to make a methodolo methodological parenthesis because this option seems easy in principle, although to find these images is not so simple. Introducing the word image in Google as a Google search will yield selected intentional pictures. Random image generators do not askew an aesthetic bias, both in subject matter and in visual terms. It seems that the word image is very much aesthetically laden. In an attempt to avoid the aesthetic bias, it would be interesting to have a repository of really unintentional images, for example, taken by robots, which programming would exclude aesthetic and thematic criteria. So, uh, in this option, we see the issues of attribution of the category query of art or not to an image, as a result, so as to say, of the projection of the human psyche onto the object. It is widely accepted that perception implies an interpretation based on preconceptions. Also, we see at play the effect of suggestion since the very instruction of the capture implies that there must be at least one case of art. Adding a twist to the well-known expression, we could say that art is in the eye and the mind of the beholder. For its part, a bot would be led by the expectations embedded in its program, which could or could not include semantic or visual criteria. If such criteria were absent, it would act blindly. The choices of this blind robot would not be such, only the fruit of chance, so the hit rate in a sequence of number, numerous attempts by this bot would be close to 50%. And now to our last model, number six. Whatever the action performed as a response to the capture challenge, ticking whatever image or images or even none, the gateway will always open. From this model perspires the conclusion that the criterion of artistry of an image cannot be fixed, or else that everything is art, or that it is pointless attempt to distinguish between humans and bots, or even that there is no ontological guarantee of the presence of a subject behind the action of clicking. Thank you very much for your attention. And here is my contact email. Bye. Hello, I'm Susan Blackmore. I'm the author of a very short introduction to consciousness. 10 things to know about consciousness. One, the mystery. Many people say consciousness is the greatest mystery facing science today. But why? Isn't it obvious this is consciousness? No, it's not. And the problem goes back to the philosophical problem called the mind-body problem. 
or in its modern incarnation, the hard problem of consciousness. It's this. We seem to have a subjective experiences that are private to ourselves. And yet we believe there is an external world that we can all see and feel and hear and touch. How can these two things relate to each other? How can a physical brain give rise to, create, be responsible for subjective experience? That's the mystery. Two, what is it like to be a bat? This weird question was asked by the philosopher Thomas Nagel in 1974, and it has become the closest thing we have to a definition in consciousness studies. The idea is this. If you ask, what is it like to be a cup? Well, nothing. There's nothing it's like to be a cup. Is that? It doesn't do anything or feel anything. But what about a bat? The idea is this. If there is something it's like to be a bat, something for the bat, the way things are for the bat, that's what we mean by being conscious. And if there's nothing it's like to be a bat, that's what we mean by not being conscious. Three, qualia. Philosophers talk about qualia, these qualitative aspects of our experience. So a quale might be, for example, the redness of this red, or the green, blue, whatever this is, of this, the experience, the way it feels to hit myself, or the smell of coffee. These are all supposed to be qualia, and they're supposed to make up our experience. But others would say, well, that's, that's a ridiculous notion. Experience isn't like that. You can't break it down into qualia, which is right. Four, the philosopher's zombie. I'm sitting here, and now imagine that there's another Sue sitting here. And she is, from the outside, indistinguishable in every way from the real Sue. She behaves and looks and acts and thinks that uh, says think the same things. But inside, she's quite different. She's not conscious. She's a zombie. There's nothing it's like to be zombie Sue. We can easily imagine such a thing, but could it exist? Some consciousness researchers say, of course it could exist. They must believe that consciousness is some kind of added extra that we might have or not have. We might have evolved to have it or not to have it. Others say that is completely wrong. Any creature that could do all these things and behave this way and think and see and feel and talk would have to be conscious by virtue of being able to do those things. So which is right? Five. Are other animals conscious? When I stood on my cat's tail, she yowled and ran away. And I'm convinced that she really felt pain. But did she? Behaviour can be misleading. I could, for example, have a toy cat and put some mechanism in its tail so that when I stamped on it, it went meow. That wouldn't prove it was conscious. There are other methods, though. We can look at the anatomy. Other mammals, dogs and cats and even bats, have similar anatomy to us, similar brain structures that make us think that probably they could feel pain. But then what about fish or caterpillars or octopuses? They have, no, they have totally different anatomy. So we can't tell from that. One last way we might tell is the physiology. Experiments with fish show that they don't like even mild electric shocks and will swim away from them. But if you give them painkillers, the same sort that I might use for a headache, then they don't mind so much. So maybe they do feel pain? Six, altered states of consciousness. We all know what it's like to feel different. We sleep, we dream, even if we don't remember our dreams, and most of us have been inebriated at some time or another in our life. But it's not obvious to know what is altered in an altered state of consciousness, or even how to measure them. Do you take someone's word for it, how they feel? Do you look to see whether they've taken some drug or been hypnotised? It's not such an easy concept as we might have first thought. Seven. The neural correlates of consciousness. One of the most popular ways of studying consciousness is to ask which bits of the brain are responsible for when we're conscious of something or when we're not. So experiments might take something like this. Are you seeing a duck or a rabbit? And then look in the brain to see where things change. And we find that low down in the visual system, nothing changes, but higher up in the brain, things flip according to to when you flip from duck to rabbit or back again. But does this really tell us where consciousness is arising in the brain? Eight, 
Is consciousness all an illusion? That might seem ridiculous. I mean, I know I'm conscious. But the so-called illusionists don't say that consciousness doesn't exist or there isn't a problem. Rather, the idea is this. We have all these wrong notions about our own minds. We think our consciousness is something we have, that we control, that it has effects and is powerful and does things. But we may be completely wrong about that. So for an illusionist, our first task is to undermine all our assumptions about consciousness and start again in the hope that this way we might see through the mystery. Nine. Free will. Consciousness and free will are closely related. I may feel as though I consciously decide to, something, to do something and that's why I do it. But when we look in the brain, we don't see that this can happen. And indeed, we can see there's the decisions being made in different parts of the brain that explain why these actions happened. And experiments also show that the conscious experience of deciding to act comes too late to be the cause of an action. So could free will be illusory? And if so, how do I live my life without believing in it? 10. The self. What is a self? I feel as though I'm inside here looking out. I'm the one who has free will, who is conscious. There's got to be a me. But when we look inside brains, we don't find anywhere that self could be or indeed anything that it would be needed to do. So what is a self? Is it a construction of the brain, a representation of a self that doesn't exist, an illusion indeed? That's an interesting thought. Who am I? What is living with anorexia really like? Well, in essence, anorexia is an illness of self-starvation and the most reliable effect of any form of starvation is obsession with food. And that's the case here. Even if the obsession a lot of the time takes the form of avoiding eating or controlling eating or compensating for having eaten, food is right there at the dark centre of it all. And it's important to note that Having anorexia does not mean eating minuscule amounts of food. If you really were just eating the cliched apple a day, then you wouldn't have anorexia for very long. It also needn't mean that you're in extreme emaciation. The, the important point is that you are eating too little for your body, including your brain, to function optimally. And that's what makes your life and your mind close in on themselves in the way that they always do. If you have anorexia right now, what would I like you to know? Well, that recovering properly will require you to eat more food over a longer period than you think is remotely plausible. It will require you to get fatter than you think you can cope with, although probably less fat than your worst fears predict. It will require you to reject many of the values that our society seems to uphold and create new ideals to live by. And it will be the most revelatory, the most powerful thing you ever do, if you do it. And you don't have to. Most people don't. Most people get themselves to that muddy no man's land somewhere between severe illness and real health. And at that point lose their nerve and pull back. If you don't want to get stuck there, pretending that this is the best of both worlds when it's actually the worst of both, then you have to keep seeking out the discomfort and allowing yourself to eat, to rest, to grow in all the ways that eventually mean that you'll realise, oh, I'm not actually living by any anorexic rules anymore. If you know someone, care about someone who has anorexia right now, I would like you to know that you don't have very much power in this and that that can be a liberation. So of course you can and should do things like encouraging the person to talk about what's going on, encouraging them to eat, seeking out treatment options for them. 
reminding them that you know that there's a problem and that you hope that they will solve it. But there is no single thing or even combination of things that you can do or say that will make it possible for this person, firstly, to wholeheartedly want to live differently, and secondly, to perform all the hundreds of thousands of repeated actions that will be necessary for them to get to a point of actually being able to live differently. That simply isn't within your power. The flip side of this, of course, is that there's also not really much you can do to make stuff a lot worse. It's already bad enough. So forget about the eggshells. You know, this, this isn't really up to you. So get on, I would say, with, with leading your life, with looking after yourself, with modelling a life that is not dictated to by anorexia, not even by someone else's. That in itself is a powerful example for, some, for someone who is stuck in the fog. And accept in the end that this is up to them. When was the last time you dreamed about what the future holds? Or changing a moment from the past? These are questions that human beings have thought about since the beginning of our existence. Where would you go if you could travel through time? It'd be great to time travel and watch some big dinosaurs walking around. It'd be great to time travel into one of the very exciting moments where there are great works of art being made, where great discoveries were being made. Watch the original Olympics. For me, being able to reach a far distant future would very much be interesting because of those reasons, just seeing and experiencing the world in a way that we just can't even fathom today whatsoever. Well, we all wish we were younger. We all wish we had more time. So wouldn't it be cool to time travel? Furthermore, I wonder what it would be like to meet Michael Faraday. I think the world would look totally different. You think 100 years ago, how different things were. I feel that we all, all of us, want to know what's going to happen in the future. And all of us would like to know what would happen in the past. To either see things that happened in the past or to alter things in our life. You can say, I don't believe this desk is here. But then you're saying, I don't want to believe facts. That's a fact. Time travel is real. Join us in a mind-bending exploration of time travel, its origins, its evolution, and its influence on how we perceive time itself. Are you conscious? Are you conscious now? Are you sure? These are the kind of questions that I hope you will enjoy asking yourself. And that's why in the book we have a set of practices, one or two in each chapter. It's important because we're studying this, what it's like, experience itself, if there is such a thing. So you could do a whole course on consciousness and entirely with intellectual ideas and theories and neuroscience and experiments. But when what we're talking about is subjective experience, I think we need to get familiar with what that's like. So are you conscious now? That's the first practice. And I suggest, and I've done this since, since I first began teaching consciousness courses in Bristol in the early 90s, um, I discovered that although I'd been asking these questions of myself for years of Zen practice and asking and, and working with koans in meditation, um, the students enjoyed it too. But it's difficult to do. I suggest that you take the question and every day for a week or longer, ask yourself hundreds of times every day, am I conscious now? It doesn't take time out of anything else. You can do it standing here, you can do it having a cup of tea, you can do it walking about, walking to classes, waiting for things to begin, any time you like. 
The trouble is, people find it hard to remember. So here are a couple of tips that students have given me for remembering. One is to do it every time you do some particular thing. So for example, every time you have a drink, then you remember to ask, am I conscious now? Or every time you go to the loo, or every time you sit down or stand up, get something and get in the habit. Another possibility is to ask a friend to, every time they see you, go, are you conscious now? And you get caught out going, ah, no, where was I? I was far away. And another trick, is to take some stickers and uh, write, am I conscious now, on, the, on there, and uh, let's have some other questions. Let me put this one on the uh, teapot. Um, did I do that consciously? Ooh, did I, was I consciously putting that on the teapot? Hmm, is this experience unified? Hmm, I'll put it up there on the knife. And where is this pain is a good one. Actually, with that one, I like to go, ah, where is that pain? Here? In my brain? Somewhere else? I don't know. But if I keep putting the stickers, oh, I could even put it on my hand. And that will remind me. Have fun with these questions. They're hard. If you find it difficult to remember, you're not alone. Everybody finds it hard to remember. But you will find you begin to know an awful lot more about your own mind and what you mean by being conscious. In Consciousness, the third edition, every chapter has either one or more activities, class activities, that you can do all together. Now I know there are some uh, teachers and lecturers who think it's a waste of time to bother to bring in props and, and actually act something out. My own feeling is that the students learn so much more, they remember so much more, they understand more quickly if you've got something to look at something to remember when you go home. So even a very simple thought experiment, like the teletransporter, can be, uh, have an advantage from something as simple as this. So what I've often done in various different ways is to introduce the philosophical teletransporter and say, right, let's have one in class here. So I'll just grab a chair and I've brought along a red button with a sticker on. Right, let's have a volunteer. Anyone would like to try out the teletransporter? Yep, come along then. Now, what's going to happen is, you're going to come here, and this can send you anywhere you want to go. Where would you like to go? New York. Um, Mars. Um, uh, South Africa. Wherever it may be. Okay, we'll choose Mars. Right, there's another one of these in, on Mars, and as soon as you want to come back, you press that one. So what's going to happen, you press the button, you're completely dematerialized, every bit of your body is destroyed and reconstructed on Mars, and then when you press the button, the same thing happens again and you come back. And the question is, will you press the button? So, I get the student to stand here and ask, either press the button or not. Many of them will say, oh, well, I wouldn't press the button because it's not safe, I won't get back safely. No, it's a good opportunity to explain the principle of thought experiments because they're all very similar in this respect. What you lay down in the thought experiment is the thought experiment. And in this case, the teletransporter is 100% safe. So you can't get out of um, refusing to press the button because you think you're not coming back. It's a thought experiment. Some students find this difficult to get their heads around. But once you've convinced them of that, OK, will they do it? Now, let's suppose this person does, hooray, press the button. We all imagine them going to Mars, coming back. How are you feeling? Are you all right? Is it still you? Whatever questions you'd like to ask, students can ask them. And that's quite fun too. Or you can get people to line up the will, wills and the won'ts, or just put their hands up. And I think what I like doing most of all is to ask all of those who say they won't press the button, why? And once you've got rid of the, because it, it's not safe, they'll go, um, it's not me. And obviously if there are maybe a few religious ones, they may say, well, my soul or my spirit won't have gone. But even those who don't believe in that, even those who are coming around to, to giving up being ego theorists and becoming bubble theorists, even they may go, but it's not me. So I think that way of forcing them to really think about it is worthwhile. And I hope you have fun with that and all the other activities.